Okay, so this here is entitled Water Lecture Number One. And you know the same instructions. You're going to watch and listen to the presentation. You're going to take notes on the key concepts and vocabulary. You got to pause this video, write down as much as you think is important, whether it's vocabulary or ideas. There are periodic slides throughout this presentation that say check for understanding. When you get to those, you should kind of look through your notes and say, do I have this information in my notes already? And yes, you will be given a notes check on this presentation for a grade. First of all, what can happen to water that falls as precipitation? Only one of two things. Water that falls as precipitation either works its way into the ground or when it hits the ground, it moves across the surface. This water that moves across the surface is called runoff. What we're going to be looking at is water that winds up down here in the ground, and that's what groundwater is. Groundwater is simply stated the water that moves into the ground after it falls as precipitation. It doesn't move across the surface. It goes into the ground. Infiltration. Infiltration is the process. Infiltration is the process of water going into the ground. In this case right here, I poured some water on top of this soil, and you can see there is no more water left because it all went into the ground. That's infiltration. Now, some water goes in the ground and some becomes runoff from every rainstorm. But what we should ask ourselves is, well, what determines how much goes in and how much stays on top? The most important factor is what is the ground like? What's it made out of? Here's two vocabulary terms that, that really help to determine how much water goes in the ground or becomes runoff. Porous means you have a lot of open spaces or pores, places that water can get into and fill up. Permeable means that water can go into the material easily. Some natural materials, like the ground, like this. You know what a sponge is? So a sponge will just soak up water. It's got a, a lot of open spaces in there, so the water can get into a sponge very easily. Some places the ground is like that. Some places, however, the ground is like our laptop tables. You know that if you pour water onto this table, it's just going to sit there. It is not going to soak in. Here's an example of a material. A natural material has low porosity. It's not very porous. It doesn't have much space to hold water, and it's not very permeable. Water can't get into it. This is the top of Stone Mountain. It's made of granite, and when it rains on top of Stone Mountain, the water can't get into the granite, so it just sits on top. And if you look at a picture of granite up close, you can see there's no open spaces in there. There's no places. There's no place for the water to to go once it gets in there anyway. So this is something that has a low porosity, not much space, and low permeability. Water can't get into it. On the other hand, sand. You know as fast as you pour water onto sand, it goes into it, and a lot of water can go into sand. Sand has a high porosity. It has a lot of open space in it. It can hold a lot of water. It also has a high permeability, which means the water goes into it very, very easily. Here are some examples of materials out there in nature, some types of rock that would have a high porosity. has a lot of open spaces, a lot of holes in there, but they're also pretty permeable. Because they have those big open spaces, the water can get in there very, very easily. Now, something that has a high porosity but low permeability, clay. Clay can hold a lot of water. It has a lot of open spaces in there, but they're not connected so easily. So the water has a hard time moving into clay. That's permeability. And you know this from living in the south where we have clay soil that after it rains, clay stays muddy for a long time. The water just kind of sits on top of clay because the clay holds so much water, but the water has a real hard time moving through it. Now, our first check for understanding, what are the two things that can happen from water that falls from the sky when it hits the ground? And these two new terms, the P words, permeable and porous. So here it goes, it rains, and, and we're gonna focus on the water that goes into the ground. We'll look at the runoff water later. And this water goes into the ground. Well, where does it go? It actually hangs out down here. 
it doesn't go on to the, you know, it doesn't move all the way to the core of the earth. It doesn't go pass all the way through the earth. There gets to be a point where the water kind of can't go any further and the water starts to stack up. So there'll be a place down here where the ground is just full of water. It is saturated. There's that term again, like we use with the air. It is saturated, it is full with water, has no more open space for it. Now, this part up here is still dry because the water can still work its way through there. And down here, we're wet. Now, these places have names. This part up at the top where water is not gathering is called the zone of aeration. Think about aeration or air. That's the part of the ground that is not full with water. The zone of saturation is the part of the ground that is full with water. All the little spaces are filled up and it can't hold any more water. This position right here, that line where we go from having the zone of aeration or our dry ground to our zone of saturation, whereas our totally wet ground, that place where that transition happens is called the water table. The water table is the point underground where the ground is now saturated or full of water. I would suggest you have a very rough diagram of, of this drawn into your notes. Now, if it rains more, let's say we get back to that water table, let's say the the ground was full to here. If we get a lot more rain and that water keeps trying to come down, that water table might rise to up here because the water's got to stack up. If it can't go any deeper, it's just going to stack on top of the old water. Now, conversely, what if it doesn't rain as much? If it doesn't rain as much, my water table might wind up down here. Because remember, water can come out of the ground and it only gets into the ground by rain or precipitation. So if we go through a dry spell, the water table goes down. There'll be less water in the ground. So here's some big ideas about the water table. These are concepts. The water table can change the depth of the water table can change and go lower it can go higher and the water table is different in different places obviously in a place where it doesn't rain a whole lot we would expect the water table to be down really low but in a place where the water where it does rain a lot the water table might be up really high that area underground where we are chock full of water this area down here has a name this is called an aquifer an aquifer is a usable collection of water underground. I don't want you to think of it as an underwater lake because it's not an open cavity, but it's a place where there's a bunch of water stuck in the ground that we can get to and then use, especially if we see something like this. We've got a rock with a bunch of holes in it, which means it can hold a lot of water. That would be an aquifer. That place where there's so much water under the ground trapped in all those little holes we can use it that's what an aquifer is so let's take a look at some examples of places with high water table places like florida florida it rains all the time so they're constantly having water going to the ground in addition the ground in florida is made of sand and we know water goes into sand very easily the land in florida is also flat so the water just sits on top of the soil or sits on top of the ground and goes into the ground very easily. Florida's water table is so high is that people in Florida can't even have basements because if you start digging down, you're basically going to hit water. So if you built a house, house with a basement, you would just constantly have water seeping through the walls and you'd basically have a underground swimming pool. In New Orleans, the water table is so high, people can't even be buried below ground. They have to put people in these chambers called a crypt or mausoleum above the ground because you can't bury somebody in water. You stick your shovel in the ground, start digging down a few feet, all of a sudden you're in a puddle. 
Now, a swamp or wetland is a place where the water table is all the way to the surface. Remember, the water table can change. So rainy times of year, the water table comes all the way up and the ground looks like this. It's saturated all the way to the surface. Other times of the year it might be drier and that water table goes back down and it's not wet like this all the time. Second check for understanding. Here's our vocabulary. We need to be able to understand how that water table can go up and down. And why can't people in New Orleans and Florida not have basements? So why are we spending so much time on groundwater? Now groundwater is clean water without any of the stuff in a lake, a river, or a stream that can be unhealthy for us. Think about this river right here. I don't want to drink my water straight out of that river because here's my cow and my cow we know is peeping, peeing and pooping into the river and I don't want to drink that. That'll make me sick. Plus, I don't know what else has been dumped into that river. In medieval times, people got sick and diseases spread very easily because raw sewage was dumped out into the streets and when it rained, the runoff water carried the sewage right into the rivers where people got their drinking water from the rivers which meant that they were drinking a lot of bacteria and viruses that made them sick you don't know what's been dumped into the river i don't want to drink this water because you can see all the junk that's in it now here's where groundwater comes into play there aren't any plants, animals, bacteria, pollution, anything deep underground. So if you can get water out of the ground where nobody's down there to touch it, it's clean. And people have always needed clean water. So towns developed, people lived someplace where they could get good clean water that wouldn't make them sick. So the question is, how do people get to that clean water that's deep underground? Well, that's the concept of a well. A well, by definition, definition, vocabulary, a well is a man-made access to groundwater. People dug wells to get to that clean water that they needed to drink. That's the whole purpose of a well. They can be all kinds of shapes and sizes. Here's some very, very large ones, what they call step wells, where people would actually walk down to the bottom of it and collect up buckets of water that they needed um, to be clean and have in their house. The largest hand dug well is in Greensburg, Kansas, where they dug a well 109 feet deep underground. The steam locomotives were coming through this town. The railroad needs water to make steam, and this town wanted to be a big uh, railroad stop, so they dug this big well and said, hey, railroads, come here. Look at all this water we can get out of the ground from our well. Here's an example of what the, what the hand dug well looks like in Greensburg. Most cities and towns in the old days, before we had modern plumbing, had a community well, a place where everybody who lived in that area could go and get water that they needed, and they took it back to their house. And this right here is the town of Bishop, Georgia, over near Athens, and this is where the town well was. Now, it's not being used anymore. It's actually capped over because, hey, we all have plumbing now. We all have you know, water pipes that bring water to our house. But towns and people lived near places where they could get to clean groundwater. Here's an example of one that's still being used today in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You can still go there today, the water's still flowing. You can still get the water out of the ground and drink it because you know it's clean, it's groundwater. Here's one in Kusadasi, Turkey, where people can come there and get and use the groundwater if they need it. This is a very, very old well in Mykonos, Greece. I, I, I couldn't tell you, I mean, there's no, designation here on how old this was, but it was obviously been around a long time and ancient times probably. And a real simple process, you can see there's, there's a bucket and on the end of a rope, there's a bucket down there. You could just put the bucket down there and bring up water. It looked like an artifact to me, but in the time that I was standing there, some locals actually came up and got some water out of the well, put it in containers and apparently took it back to their home. So wells are still used today to get drinking water. This well in Vietnam, uh, still used today, you can see it's just a long, deep pit. They dug a hole in the ground till they got to the point where the water table was and there was water collected down there. While I was standing there, a guy comes up on a motorbike and he takes water out of that well, put it in these containers. There's a thought that the, 
that this water coming out of this particular well gives the noodles that they cook in the local ramen shops a particular uh, flavor that people want. So the local restaurants actually will still come here and get their water from this well. Now, modern homes also have wells. Now they don't look at so much like the bucket being down there in the in, in the in you know a hole in the ground, but you drill a hole in the ground. Out in the country, especially, and this is not too far from us. This is outside of Athens. Once again, you'll you'll sometimes see these houses, and they have seem like a, a little like almost like a brick doghouse next to the building. That's not a brick doghouse. That's the well house. There they have a pump that's bringing water up out of the ground and in there is a pump that will then pump it through a pipe and pump it into the house. This is what that looks like there. That's a modern looking well. So we got the idea. We understand people dig wells to get it good clean drinking water, but something happens over time. Uh, a well is kind of like a pipe with a bunch of holes. It's like a straw in the ground, but you're not just soaking up water out here at the bottom. You soak up water throughout the sides, especially because there's there's filters along there that will help you filter out things like the minerals and the dirt. Well, you start drinking out of the ground from this area here, and you can actually start to dry up the ground around your well, and this happens naturally. You actually get a little V-shaped area around your well called the cone of depression. The cone of depression is the area around a well where the ground gets a little drier. And it's gonna get drier because you're pulling that water out of the ground. So when you sink your well, you have to make sure you go lower than the water table. Otherwise, you won't get enough water. Notice this area back here behind me. You can tell by the view it's very, very dry and brown. I'm in Utah. It doesn't rain very much here. It rains very, rains very little at all. But if you'll notice here, they're growing corn. And corn is a very thirsty vegetable. It takes a lot of water to grow corn. So the question becomes, how can they grow corn here if it doesn't rain very much? Well, here's your answer. If it's not falling from the sky, they must be getting water from up under the ground. This right here is a good example of a well. It doesn't look like what we think of with a well where you've got a hole in the ground and you crank the bucket down there and scoop up water. This is what most modern wells look like, especially the ones that are found on farms, which is what most groundwater is used for today, and that's in growing crops. There's our pipe and it goes hundreds of feet down there under the ground and it brings up the groundwater and it sends it through these pipes here and sprinkles it on top of our corn and that allows our corn to grow. Remember that most groundwater use in our country is for growing crops. Now you don't see a lot of these in Georgia because in Georgia it does rain enough. You're going to see these more in the middle part of the country where there's a lot of farmland, but not as much rain. So they make up for the lack of rain by getting water out of the ground. If you ever fly in an airplane and you look out the window, especially as you go a little bit further west, you're going to see these green circles. And those are the places where the wells are spinning around kind of like a yard sprinkler in a circle. Now, those aquifers, there is, there's those really big collections of usable water under the ground. And the biggest, most important one in our country is called the Ogallala Aquifer. And it's named for a town here in Nebraska called Ogallala. It's an Indian name. That Ogallala Aquifer is huge. It's, it covers the size of a couple of states. It's a huge collection of water deep underground. And the farmers in that part of the country reach down there with these wells and they soak up the water basically like through a big straw and spread it over their crops. And that gives their crops, their corn, enough water to grow. If we took all the water out of that aquifer, it would cover the whole United States in about a foot and a half of water. There's a lot of water down there. Now, if we take all the water out, it would take about 6,000 years for the rain to fill it back up naturally. So you have to be careful 
you you can't take out water faster than it's going in because you're going to run out of water and this aquifer is the most important one in our country because it's the one that we use to grow our corn and we use corn for so many things it's not just eating corn it's also how we get our, our sugary syrups to sweeten things it comes from a, a sugar that's we refine from corn now there's some problems with this aquifer there's a lot of farms and they're all taking out water and you're in a part of the country where it doesn't rain very much well if it's not raining much that means the water table is going to tend to go down and you're having people taking out a lot of water so the water table is dropping with this aquifer we're taking water out faster than we're putting water back in that leads us to this discussion here some some terms groundwater recharge is the rate at which water goes in precipitation now discharge is the rate at which water comes out generally us going down there and sucking the water out with wells the aquifer water balance is simply the balance between the two how much water is going in versus how much water is coming out if your balance is negative it means you're losing water faster than you're gaining it and you're gonna run out and that's the concern with that aquifer in the middle part of our country because if we run out of water in that aquifer it's not going to rain enough in that part of the country to grow all the corn that we need some people think as early as 2028 now they're starting to do kind of some different things to to help improve water usage in that part of the country because they realize they can't run out of water as early as 2028. there's also another concern this has been in the news for years up here in canada they were they found some oil well they don't make oil into gasoline up there in canada they make oil in the gasoline down here in texas so they wanted to run a pipeline through this part of the country to get the oil to make gasoline well a lot of people in the middle part of this country said whoa wait a minute we don't want you putting a big pipe of oil underneath our ground because pipes can burst pipes can leak and if oil gets into that ogallala aquifer all that water we're using to grow our corn it could pollute it and make it unusable so this has gone on through a couple of presidential administrations now about the fight as to how we can route that pipeline most people want it to go like this kind of go around that aquifer of course the oil companies don't because it's a lot more pipeline they have to build it costs them a lot more money but there's a very real danger with having an underground oil pipeline run through your source of drinking water now here in Atlanta it's not a big deal for us we have plenty of surface water we got this nice big river here there's the Chattahoochee River down near Columbus we got a big river right down the street we got big creek we got John's Creek we we have all these you know creeks and ponds and lakes all sitting around us you can't you can't look anywhere and not see enough water up here on the surface and it rains all the time in Atlanta so for us we don't need to get water from under the ground so much because we've got rivers lakes and streams on the surface very close by so here's a map of the river major rivers in Georgia and you can see the whole state is nothing but major rivers because it rains so much so we don't have to use groundwater as much here in Georgia there are some wells especially historically before you know some older wells still around but for the most part we don't need them here in Georgia because we get enough rain here's the map of U.S. aquifers remember an aquifer is that underground collection here's that Ogallala one that one in blue if you'll notice here in our part of Georgia there isn't one there is not a significant aquifer underneath us in Atlanta even though it rains all the time we actually don't have a lot of groundwater most of our water actually stays up on the surface so yeah you can dig a well but it's not going to be as fruitful it's not going to give you as much water as say if you live in Florida where there's a ton of water right there under the ground now South Georgia on the other hand once you get south of what they call a fall line right in the middle of the state down here in South Georgia it's flatter the land is different and you're closer to Florida you're underneath you're on sorry you're on top of that Florida aquifer 
So people in South Georgia can use wells a lot more than people in North Georgia. Now, 87% of the people in this country get water, get their drinking water from a pipe that comes into their house. Only about 13% of people still really get their uh, water from wells. And the reason is nowadays we all have modern plumbing. You know, 100 years ago, if you lived out in the country, you didn't have somebody who was willing to send a pipe to your house and bring you water. So you dug a well. In 1950, what was it, 80 years ago, 30% of all households in the U.S. used well water. I mean, they, they dug a hole in the ground and got their water out of the ground that way. Now it's down to 13%. Most groundwater today isn't used for drinking. It's used for farming. Now, there are three significant states that take a lot of water for groundwater for uh, farming. California is a big one because it doesn't rain much in California. Same thing with Texas. They use a lot of groundwater. Florida uses a lot of groundwater because it's sitting right there. They're right on top of that big Ogallala aquifer. So at this point, you should check out this final check for understanding. Make sure you have definitions for all these vocabulary terms. Be able to answer these questions before we take the notes check.